Hello and welcome to the Widow's Well. Today I want to discuss a very good question that one of the su subscribers asked me and I really want to invite anyone if you ever have a question please ask me. It really sometimes helps to see um, what type of videos are necessary. So I really valued this question. This question actually goes in very well with what I'm currently discussing or have started to discuss, which um, is regarding the church and the denominations and all its creeds and the doctrines of men, which we are struggling with in the in the church. So let us have a look at, at this question. Um, I've written it down here and we can read it. She basically says the churches in the US are almost all denominational. I suppose this helps one to know what a church believes before deciding to attend. We do have non-denominational churches, but they are also steeped in their personal belief systems. Do you read Hebrews 10 verse 25? Do not forsake the assembly of believers as not necessarily having to take place in a building as long as we gather in some form. What about the breaking of bread? Thank you for sharing because I too am struggling with attending a church that adheres to all these man-made doctrines and creeds. Now, before I answer the questions, I want to firstly say that I'm absolutely not against the church. The church has its place um, and it especially has its place with spreading the gospel and basically being all things to all men. It is a place where men can be received, but if you are serious about the word of God and if you are born again and if you grow then in time you will find that you you will start to see that um, the church has all these doctrines and creeds and what essentially happens is you outgrow it. In a sense the church is also a place where people are received, broken people, sinners, um, and it, it does have its place. So I am not against the church or seeking to break it down. What I'm doing is I'm sharing my journey as a disciple of Jesus. And that a part of that journey is coming out of the church. Now, I don't say that if you listen to my channel that you should come out of the church at all. Um, because the Holy Spirit will tell you to do it. You will hear the call come out of her, my people. Now, the church is not Babylon. Babylon is the synagogue of Satan. And I, I will I plan to speak about that later again. But Babylon is the mother of harlots. So once a church falls back into law keeping or um, starts to adhere to the doctrines of men, the church can become a harlot daughter of Babylon. It is possible. And we are living in a time where the leaven of the Pharisees is spread throughout the Western culture in an attempt to conquer, you know. So we do have this problem, but we need to be very careful to just say everybody must leave their fellowships. We must hear from the Lord. Um, Israel of old, they had, you know, the, the tent of meeting and they moved as the Lord showed them. When he moved, they moved. And when he stopped, they stopped. And that's how we must approach this, by listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you and give you the power if and when it is time for you to come out of a fellowship. However, I want to show you a scripture which tells us that this is exactly the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to this day to seek the lost sheep, those who can hear his voice. Now, I'm speaking spiritually. In his day, it was the literal 
uh, tribes lost, uh, well, they weren't lost, but they were scattered all over. And um, But now if we speak about it spiritually, we're saying that there are those that give their lives to him and through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he enables us to hear his voice and to follow him. So it's by that gift of faith that he gives. Faith comes from hearing the word of God and then we are able to hear the voice of our shepherd and we are able to start to follow him. And we can't just, uh, you know, go according to the pattern of another believer because if we are not ready, it can be very traumatic for us and our families when we leave. Um, on the other hand, we must also know that Jesus did come to bring the vision and we are to follow him above our families. And my experience of leaving the physical church was that it did cause great upheaval, but in the end, it profited um, my immediate family in spiritual growth. But there was a stage where it was really difficult um, and it depends on how entrenched you are in your church. So you'd need to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you what to do because for some it may be that the Holy Spirit of God wants you to stay there and to minister. But the problem is you cannot reform it, you see. So it would have to be ministering from a place of love and you yourself would um, need to keep growing you otherwise you're going to stagnate there like um you know lot's wife when she became a pillar of salt so the pattern i've seen is that if you get serious to follow christ you you'll probably leave the formal church um, it will be very very difficult to stay as your eyes open and as you become more and more hungry for the word of god um, and once you've seen things spiritually, you can't unsee them. So in this, you need to follow the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you the power to leave and the grace to leave. Um, or it may be that you leave for a season and return to minister to those that are there. But the thing is that when people stay there, they are very stiff-necked, even though they may have many wonderful works that they do. And they they do wonderful things that are needed, um, but they do not want to hear the true words of Jesus Christ. And so it would be, in my experience, very difficult to remain there and to actually have fellowship. Um, it would be a bit like um, a woman that is trying to have fellowship with her little children. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So what works better is to walk with fellow believers that are born again um, and to be built up and grow strong and then to minister to the ones that come later you know so that's generally what I've seen but please do not feel if you are still in a church that you are sinning by not coming out straight away let the Holy Spirit lead you it will just happen naturally and when you are stronger and um, you you have maybe gained a bit more insight into those that can't see that your your going away may be more um, Christ-like because sometimes initially we can we can be so shocked at what we see that the going away uh, can be traumatic or cause a lot of ructions and upheavals or not be a good testimony to the Lord. But in all of it, I'm not saying stay, I'm not saying go, I'm saying listen to what the Spirit says to you inside and when it is time. With me, I knew I would go, but I knew it wasn't time yet and it was still a couple of months to stay within and at the right time, I had time to go out um, and that was necessary for me to 
seek the Lord on my own without being told what to believe um, because the ch church do lord it over our faith. In 2 Corinthians 1 um, verse 24, we read an uh, important verse. It says, Paul says there, speaking to the Corinthians, not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. And Paul was such a good example of being a fellow worker um, for, the, for the joy of the believers, because he was the one that encouraged them to test all things and hold fast to what is good. And we know about the Bereans that, you know, they tested the spirits. John encouraged us to test the spirits because there are many false spirits. So all of them were, all of the apostles were encouraging that believers grow. Peter kept saying about how we grow and that we should patiently endure um, and and Paul, yeah, and in other places, says that it is about faith, that each should be convinced in their own mind. Because we walk at, we are at different places and walk at different paces. We are not all the same. Just like in the world, people are different and they have different um, strengths and they learn at a different pace. So is it regarding our spiritual growth each one of us is different and it is we are supposed to learn from the father now unfortunately the church just like the pharisee system in jesus's time they have tried to have dominion over the faith of believers and they do not encourage believers to test the spirits and to examine all things. They, in fact, warn against um, what they see as strange doctrines, which are often the truth, and they holding the strange false doctrine. Now, if you look at John 10, you can see there the ministry of Jesus Christ. And if you read uh, verse 9, Jesus says, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And that's such an interesting scripture. You go, you will enter by him, be saved, go in, but also go out and find pasture. And this idea I also found in the Old Testament in Malachi 4. Now I'm speaking spiritually of the day of the Lord because for each one of us, when we get born again, there is a spiritual day of the Lord where the son of righteousness arises for us. It happens inwardly and spiritually. The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Very interesting. It's the same idea. And then it speaks of basically of victory. It says, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Now, spiritually speaking, that is what we were promised, is that, you know, we'll be able to tread on snakes and scorpions. We will overcome evil. We will overcome the evil one. And that's what um, the churches in Revelation are promised too. It keeps saying, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. So the scripture says, when Christ sets you free, you will be free indeed. So to me, there seems to be a process of taking you out of the world into the church for a season and then to be led out there again. You see, so that's why I'm saying the church has its role and we must um, not go away and damage the believers that are still there or those that maybe are not believers, but they are there. And um, 
you know, we we maybe dam damage them because they can hurt you very much. They can often be very persecutory and very cruel. So it's important to pray to go away with a with a in a good way. Now the sister starts her question with a comment where she says most of the churches are denominational. I'd say it's true in all the West. And I agree with what she says here. I suppose this helps one to know what a church believes before deciding to attend. And when I spoke about denominations the other day and looked at the word denomination, it actually um, was interesting to me that the denomination is a branch. And I thought, you know, trees have a branch. Trees have branches. There's nothing wrong with a branch. Branches are very different. Some branches are thick, some are crooked, some are thinner. And what I thought is that the uniformity is not in the branches. The uniformity is in the fruit, you know? So the branches may look very different of the tree. The question is, what is the fruit, you know, of the tree? Is it going to bear good fruit and are we going to be part of this harvest or just of the branch because the Lord wants us to bear fruit so that helped me think the tree may look very different and even may have gnarly type of branches but in the end all the fruit is going to be according to the root of that and if that root is Christ the fruit will be uniform. Now, we want to be part of that fruit. And we want to grow to the point of bearing fruit. So please understand me in that. Again, I'm not saying the denominations are wrong. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm pointing out what Paul said, is that the fact that there are denominations um, show the carnality. However, the Lord knew this when he grew this tree. Um, and it's all part of his plan, you see. So when a believer matures and is going to be fruit, then you're going to start to become uniform. Because the scripture says there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, um, and so on. Uh, you know that scripture. Whereas the denominations have many doctrines, many different ways of baptisms, it's not uniform yet. Um, but I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying that in order to mature, we need to move beyond that part of the tree, if I can put it that way. I absolutely agree. It's important to know what the denomination teaches. Um, and I wanted to show you also that the scripture even speaks of non-denominational churches, which I agree, they basically are a, also a denomination. They, they just have their own um, belief system. Yeah, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12, it says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. So this one that says I'm of Christ is basically your non-denominational church. But even they hold on to their own teachings. So we want to move beyond the doctrines and the teachings of men um, to the point where the Father is teaching us by his words which come from his mouth, um, which the Messiah spoke to us. Now let's look at the next part here, um, which is basically the first part of uh, the first question that she asks. She asks about Hebrews 10 verse 25, um, do not forsake the assembly of believers. And of course, if one leaves your denominational church, this is the scripture that they pound you with. So let's have a look at Hebrews 10 verse 25 and then speak about it. So if we look at Hebrews 10 verse 25 in the East Sword, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day 
approaching. Now, I want to say in one level, when you are a new believer, this is very important um, because the encouragement of the church does help people to get their lives on track. So it's definitely an important thing to assemble together. And for many people, they slowly but surely by attending church, um, they can help themselves and their family get out of the mire of this filthy earth and all its disgusting ways. So I absolutely agree that this is true to that people should assemble together. But if we now look at that word, assembling together, let us have a look at that meaning of that word in the Esau. The word comes from a base which basically means to collect upon the same place or to gather together, obviously, specifically a Christian meeting for worship, so gathering together. Now, this is the thing, is we must ask ourselves in that fellowship, are they actually a collection of believers? Are they true believers? Because many call themselves Christians, many say, Lord, Lord, but Christ himself said he does not know them, um, even though they do many mighty works. So in one sense, I would say for, for many people, meeting together like that is important and it does strengthen society. It does keep the moral fabric together. And that's why I don't want to just say leave the church um, or we must, um, you know, be against the church. We must be very careful of doing that because, as I say, the church has its fault function. It is a bulwark in the society. But once we are born again and the Lord starts to feed us, we will start to see that this meeting is not necessarily believers. They are not true believers that gather together. So we must ask ourselves, if we gather with them, are we actually gathering and being obedient to assembling ourselves together as believers? If we look at Peter in 1 Peter 2, he says the following words. He says, Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house. And then he goes on to speak about it. So coming to Jesus, you it says you get rejected by men, but God chooses you and then you, he builds you up part of the spiritual house. Now that is the gathering, a spiritual gathering of the believers being built into this spiritual house. So in order to be a living stone, it often requires leaving your fellowship and being rejected of men to become part of the spiritual house, the true temple of God, which cannot be seen. It's not here nor there. It, Jesus said they won't say, look here, look there. Don't listen when they say he's here or he's there because the kingdom of God is within you. And in John 4, he told the Samaritan woman, he said, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So what he was telling her is he was bringing in a system where people could worship him within their own self because they would be the temple. So it's not about a physical building. Um, the Samaritans worshipped at a certain mount, mountain. And of course, the Jews believed you had to go to Jerusalem. But Jesus brought this wonderful new way where we worship him in spirit and truth. 
he said, but the hour is coming and now is. In other words, it was there already since he came. When the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship him in spirit and truth. And that is why we are gathered together in another way as part of the spiritual New Jerusalem. So there is a gathering, um, a not a natural ga gathering in the form of your church building, but now a spiritual ga gathering once you are ready to actually give yourself as this living stone or the living sacrifice, which Paul spoke about. Give yourself your body as a living sacrifice and be built into this spiritual temple. And so, yes, we must gather in some form. Uh, the Lord said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am. Even if you watch a video of another brother and sister or make a comment um, we are actually meeting together in a spiritual sense. So you need to be very careful when you leave your physical fellowship that you know you've matured to the point where you are going to um, be able to handle being alone uh, because it is, you end up being alone. You can via the internet, um, you know, fellowship, and it really works very well if you need that space to actually examine all things and not be told what to think. Although there is also, even in internet fellowships, there is uh, some lording over your faith, which you need to be careful of. Um, one must also remember that, you know, that people are, are sinful and they are not perfect. And many of those that are leaders are actually trying to keep the wolves out. Now, in the process of trying to keep wolves out, they sometimes are quite harsh um, and they can end up lording it over your faith. So your eye needs to be on Christ alone and to hear his voice and to hear when he tells you it is time to move on. It is a journey. And a great part of it is spent walking alone. So don't leave your fellowship when you know in your heart you are not ready to do it. But maybe your heart really desires to, to obey the voice of the Lord where you start to hear him uh, come out. Um, but... You will know when it is time. You will give you the power to do it in the right manner and to be able to bear with the loneliness that comes from it. So it needs to be done in the right, at the right time and in the right way. Many people, their faith does get shipwrecked um, when they are no longer among physical brethren. Um, and that's why it is so important that you follow Christ alone and not hold on so much to those uh, physical relationships that you cannot follow the Lord wherever he goes. There is a point where you de do need to walk alone, but make sure it's the right time. As it says in the Song of Solomon, do not wake up love before the time is right, you know. So walk with the Lord, pray. He will lead you out. He will give you the strength to do it when and if it is time. Now the sister also asks about breaking of the bread. We know that the church have um, the communion, uh, which is a physical breaking of the bread which symbolizes the bread of life Jesus Christ so let us think what about that now what we need to understand is that the Lord is a very good father he understands the frailty of man and so he has certain patterns which he sets up on earth for those that do not understand so they partake of certain ritual actions 
Um, and even though they do not understand, the father receives them. Just like a child, you know, they don't understand everything, but they are still part of the family if they're a small child. Um, in the same way, we grow spiritually, we mature, and we are able to understand more things. Now, the same with communion. Now, you will understand if you follow here with me in Hebrews 8, it basically speaks here of the... Um, the sanctuary being a pattern of the heavenly things. Let's read there in Hebrews 8. So in Hebrews 8, let's read there from verse 3 to verse 6. It says, For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So we can see that the whole um, sacrificial system there, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 8, it was only a shadow of heavenly things or a pattern. You see, so it was an earthly manifestation where they built something earthly to represent something heavenly because the people couldn't understand heavenly things. Now, in the Lord's Supper, you get very much the same thing, um, where they break the bread and, and drink the wine as a representation of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. But we know that eating his body means basically eating his word. He said in John 6 from verse 53, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So how does he abide in us? He abides in us through his word, and we abide in him by abiding in his word. So we can see that eating Christ's flesh means partaking of the word. Um, and so, yeah, when Paul um, speaks about the Lord's Supper, he says it is the body of Christ or the flesh, you see? And that is why I made this post here in my community section where I said that the marriage supper of the Lamb basically is the word of God. Um, it says there, and he said to me, right, blessed are those called to the banquet of the marriage of the Lamb or the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So people imagine a literal marriage supper like being at a marriage, but it actually means spiritually partaking of the true words of God. So people take the Bible and they set up many doctrines and all those are not the true words of God. The marriage supper of the Lamb means partaking of Christ. It means being taught of God. So if you go back and you read, the, it's a good idea to read the whole of John 6. You will see where he speaks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood he actually ties it to being taught of God. In other words, if you have ears to hear, you will come to him and be taught of God because they were 
pouring through the scriptures, seeking eternal life in them, um, as people do today, you know? But you have to come to Christ and you have to partake of the sayings of God, the truth of God, the true doctrine of Christ, and that you can only do by having the Holy Spirit. So the blood of Christ is the Holy Spirit because just like it says in the Bible, the life is in the blood. Without the Holy Spirit, it is just dead letters and men are carnal and they do not understand these words. And so to them, the Lord's Supper is, while they can understand that the bread and the wine represents Christ and his blood that was shed for them, they don't understand that when we are talking to each other as believers, as we are doing in this video, for example, and we are meeting in a spiritual sense and we are understanding his word in the spiritual sense, then we are actually having the true supper of the Lord, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where it's about not about the letter of the law or the literal meaning, but about the spiritual meaning behind it. Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life, just like blood. His blood gives life. The flesh profits nothing. In other words, the carnal understanding. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And in fact, carnal understanding can lead to destruction. Peter said about Paul's letters that they are hard to be understood and men twist them to their own destruction. And we can see that at the moment with this Christian Zionism. It is causing death and destruction on a scale that is incomprehensible to me. Um, so it's about the spirit. So even though the Lord is kind and lets us partake of literal bread and which we understand represents Christ, he also brings us to the understanding that when we share spiritually and we, we connect spiritually with, with those that are born again and we grow in the spirit and we partake of his spirit words, and we get built into the spiritual temple, which is the true gathering of the saints, which cannot be seen. The kingdom of God does not come by observation. And the new Jerusalem is not visible. It is spiritual. So we learn to understand that this communion is the thing we do with other believers when we are partaking of scripture, when we are comparing uh, scripture with scripture, when we are learning to rightly divide the word, when we are helping each other to get rid of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is in our spiritual bread. This is the true fellowship. This is the true marriage supper of the Lamb. The true words of God. Christ said we must live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4 verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so this is our desire, is to eat the true words of God, to partake of the true words of God. Rather than the doctrines of men, which is this carnal, fleshly supper of God. It's the truth mixed in with the carnal ideas of men, which is corruption in the end. So this question of this dear subscriber really um, sums up where we are at the moment in this channel. You know, we understand that we are not saved by works, but we actually have to understand what is the true baptism.
because we are told there is one baptism, yet we see many different baptisms even described in scripture. What is the true baptism? And what is laying on of hands? Who is teaching us? Are we being taught of men or are we being taught of our heavenly father? And so that is what this is actually all about, is about the spiritual things and being taught of our father. And so I want to tell you that when you leave your physical fellowship, when it is time, you do not forsake the assembly of the believers. You just become part of another assembly. And you still partake of bread, even though it may not be the physical bread anymore. Now, once you understand what the true communion is and the bread and the wine, you will under start to understand that partaking of the physical bread and the physical wine is just a pattern. Just like the tabernacle was just a pattern of the true temple of God, which is within man. Now, it's not wrong to, when you go to a church, you don't have to explain this to the people because they will not understand it. They will not be able to receive it. As you can see there in John 6, they rejected Jesus. They were horrified when he said they must eat his flesh and drink his blood. In the same way, if you were to tell the people what is the true communion, they would not understand you and they would think you a heretic. So it's best not to tell them because they are not ready for it. In John 6, Jesus actually says to us, no one can come to him unless the Father draws them, you see? So the Father draws you to him and then he will raise you up spiritually. Now that happens spiritually when you are born again. It, it's not like people think one day. Um, it's now when you are born again, he raises you up spiritually. So yeah, in where Paul describes the Lord's Supper, he said, Jesus said, this do as often as you drink in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So that is what the church does, is they proclaim the Lord's death, you see, through that, because they don't understand it spiritually. But once you are born again, he's raised you up. He's raised you up. So in a sense, spiritually, he has come to you. You see, and so the physical things start to be less meaningful to you. And you start to desire the spiritual things. But that does not mean that we need to reject those that do not understand it. Um, we accept them in love as our brothers and sisters that are still carnal and babes in Christ. But the best thing we can do for them is move on to maturity because then we can minister to them or those that follow later on. So the sister also says she's struggling with attending the church that adheres to man-made doctrines. And I can so identify with you, sister. Um, I also um, woke up before my husband. We both were born again, but because I had more time to study the scriptures, the, my eyes became open before him and it caused great um, strife and trouble in our household for a couple of years. And it's difficult, especially for us women when that happens, but we get through it, you see, because if we follow the Lord, our example and our love and our understanding eventually does um, benefit our families and so it may be difficult at the beginning 
but it's absolutely worth it because Jesus said, except a grain fall in the ground and die, it cannot um, grow up and bring forth much fruit. In the same way, we basically die to the old way, the carnal way, to be raised up to the newness of life. And in the new life, everything is different. It's spiritual. It's not tangible. And um, it's very difficult to actually communicate this to, to others except those that are also born again and have matured somewhat. Because even when we are born again, it's not like that from the beginning. But it's a wonderful journey. And I absolutely encourage you, if you hear that the Spirit says it's time to go outside the camp, then it's time to go and you should not fear. Um, it feels like death when it happens, but it brings life. Just like Jesus, he said, we, you have to die to live. You have to die to the old way to be raised up to the new way.